All right. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Kitchen Hub World's Fair. Hey, we uh, are at our. Boy, we're almost. We're a little over halfway done with our presentations now for our three-day event here. We've had some great content so far, and um, as always, really looking forward to this next one with 3M. Um, one of our favorite topics: corrosion protection. One of our favorite presenters, Ryan, and uh, we're going to head up to uh, help, help to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Check with Ryan and uh, talk about corrosion protection. Ryan, you got a couple of products for, for us to look at today? I do, Jason. I've, I've got just a few products set out here, as you can see. Um, thanks for that introduction. I really appreciate you guys, uh, Kristen and Jason and Larry, allowing us uh, here at 3M to do a portion of our presentations this week remotely. Um, it's really helped out with a lot of our schedules. I know tomorrow you guys have Brady down there. Um, in your facility. So I, he's really excited for that. But yeah, I'm very excited, as you mentioned, uh, Jason, because this is a topic that you and I have discussed at, in a, a, you know length many, many times. And it's an area that I'm very passionate about. You know, my experience in the industry, this was one area that I always felt was one of the most important areas to focus on, because this is what the customers see. This is what, and you guys do a lot of post repair inspections. I follow your stuff on, on social media. In my opinion, one of the easiest things to spot in a post repair inspection, excluding like your gaps in your fitment, you know, and paint and color issues is seam sealer OEM replication and corrosion protection, right? And we're not gonna talk a lot about seam sealer OEM replication here at all today. We're gonna talk just a little bit about it and how it plays into overall corrosion protection. But as Jason mentioned, the theme of this whole presentation is restoring that OEM corrosion protection because we can't duplicate what they did from the factory. Right, we can only replicate it with the products and the processes that we have here at 3M and many of the paint companies have out there for applying additional external coatings to really restore that vehicle to its pre-accident crash worthiness. So before I jump in here, Jason, we did this on Monday, but I'm surprising you with another demo here today. So if you wouldn't mind, because I get accused quite often on social media and other places of sort of hocus pocus or magic, I want you to give me another uh, industry appropriate term that we can use on your channel live here and not get kicked off to right onto this panel. Well, I think we had uh, Kristen and Holly the other day saying we'll go with Larry today. We'll put Larry on there today. Nice. All right, so we got Larry written on here. And on this side, I'm going to prove the glass is dry, the metal's dry. I haven't done anything funny. I'm simply just putting these two together. I'm going to be installing a couple clamps. And what this is replicating here is a pinch weld in that repair joint. So this could be a quarter panel, could be a rocker panel. It's anywhere we've done any sort of welding, sectioning, or even the backside of a panel. I'm going to set this here in some cavity wax, and we're going to come back to this at the end of the presentation. I'm going to leave it here, and you'll be able to see it on a couple of different camera angles, but it won't move unless I'm clumsy and I knock it off the table. Um, has happened before, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna visit this because this is going to be a very important demonstration to really emphasize the you know cavity wax itself. So yesterday, if you guys didn't tune into Sean's presentation, he had a great presentation on uh, structural and bonding adhesives. And he mentioned during that presentation, the important role that they play in preventing corrosion. And he was spot on because really in the repair process, this is where it actually begins. When 3M products come into that repair, Adhesives are what we're going to be using in conjunction with a lot of mechanical fasteners. They could be squeeze type resistance welds, rivets, uh, weld bonding, hem flanging, or other attachment methods. Um, and this is where we're going to achieve our initial corrosion protection during that repair process. But it's not where it ends. All right. One of the things that I want to present to your, to your audience here, Jason, and they can post it up in the chat, um, and then I'll just kind of keep going here. But when I say you know, steel can rust. My first question is, what does that mean to you? What is what is corrosion on steel? And my second question is, can aluminum rust? All right, I want you to focus on those, those two. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second here, Jason. Um, and I wanna hear just a couple of answers that, that may have popped into the chat. But typically after we use it, you know, ad adhesives to put the vehicle together, this is really where sort of that, procedural um, documentation gets tossed aside. 
right? They may follow the OEM repair procedures. They may be getting it from a third party uh, resource or they may be just winging it. But really when they get to this point and they've, they've found out where to section it, where to weld it, what types of welds and what types of adhesives, I commonly see this when I go out that this is where they stop reading the repair procedures. But I'm gonna be honest with you, they continue talking about all these other products that you see here in front of you. And these all play an important role in preventing corrosion, not only in the, the use of the product, but the preparation for the use of the product. Again, we were trying to restore that vehicle back to its pre-accident crash worthiness. So Jason, did we get any replies to, to my question there in the comment section? Well, we got some yeses for corrosion coming in here. So uh, certainly it's raining here today. I know what the weather's been like up there. So, uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we got some- It's pouring rain aluminum. here too, buddy. So it's- Is it? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we got okay, some so know, aluminum can, can corrode, yes. Yes, so I love the fact that they use corrode. And actually what it is, is it's oxidizing. And it's important. And I want you to remember that throughout this segment because the misconception a lot of times is that well, steel corrodes and aluminum has like, it just, it's a self-healing element. You know, it doesn't corrode, it doesn't rust, but it, it does. And it's that oxidized layer. It's that white film that builds, you know, 30 minutes to 60 minutes after the surface has been exposed, it's building. Rust, as we know it, is just a term. It's actually not, a, you know, uh, what it is. What, what steel corroding is, is actually oxidizing. What we know as rust is the iron element that's in steel that's not in aluminum. Aluminum is a very strong product in itself. Aluminum oxide is in a lot of different types of abrasives um, because it is so strong and it provides that protection you know, on those, uh, uh, the medias that go into building abrasives. So when we talk about corrosion here today, I'm referring to everything you know, going on steel and aluminum. Right, we need to make sure we're preventing corrosion on aluminum. And as you guys all know, you guys have been in the industry, you know, those of you even entering the industry, aluminum is rapidly growing. EV vehicles and everything else, the light weighting feature of vehicles require aluminum to be used. And really, after you get it from body or from uh, structural and bonding adhesives into the body filler segment, because that's typically the next step in the process, we're going to be repairing, you know, that weld section joint perhaps right, on the rocker or the sail panel, maybe it's a B post if it's acceptable, acceptable, sorry, by the OEM. And body filler, the selection and use of body filler can be important with that. So my next question here, Jason, is does anybody um, know, right, or do any of the OEMs have procedures or bulletins for recommendations for the use of an application of fillers? Right, so I'm just gonna wait here just a second. I wanna see if anybody can reply to that in the, in the uh, chat comment. So again, do any of the OEMs have procedures or bulletins or recommendations for the use and application of body fillers? Yeah. Right, and again, I wanna highlight, we're talking both steel and aluminum here today and preventing corrosion, we're restoring the corrosion protection and part of restoring it is preventing it. So Jason, any initial uh, feedback there in the chat? Uh, nothing yet necessarily, but uh, what we do want to do is I want to give a shout out to Mitchell. I believe it was Mitchell who commented on your uh, your rust question with uh, aluminum, and and he came in right right before you mentioned and said that um, aluminum doesn't rust because it doesn't have iron in it. So he gets a gold star for uh, for for that, or maybe a hundred shoot bucks or something. So, uh, but yeah, we got that. Right. We do have some I love it. Recommendations say, saying yes, OEMs do have some corrosion protection information out there. Yes, so they, so they do, and particularly in the area of aluminum um, is where many of the OEMs will have bulletins or procedures saying before you even apply body fillers, you have to use an epoxy primer to protect that aluminum surface. Um, some OEMs, Ford in particular, they call out our quick grip um, body filler that can be used directly to aluminum um, in some repair instances, but we got to make sure that we're staying within that 60 minute time frame from when the surface was exposed, so when the abrasive exposed that aluminum surface, to when we actually complete the application of body filler so that it does not start to oxidize. And then likewise, after we're done with our body filler, we need to make, we're applying that you know, epoxy uh, primer coating to protect that aluminum from any oxidization in and around the body filler that could work its way in before the vehicle's actually painted, all right? Most of the time when you're talking about, you know, glazes and other things, they're approved, you know, for direct to metal applications. But one of the things I want to highlight here and why I called out that Ford procedure specifically, because they do require epoxy primer to be uh, applied to any bare aluminum surfaces, with the exception of 
our quick grip product and one other product that is called out in the industry that can be applied to bare aluminum. The OEMs, I think one thing that, you know, you've probably heard Sean and I talk a lot about, Jason, I know you guys are passionate about this as well. The OEMs are the experts on how the vehicle is built and should be reconstructed in the event of an accident. Okay, so what they say actually supersedes anything that a product manufacturer would say. Now we at 3M, we work with these OEMs. We do a lot of testing. We do a lot of um, application testing, product testing, performance testing to make sure that we're meeting their specifications and we work directly with them. We have many teams located not only in the US but around the world that work on a daily basis to, with these OEMs to address these types of problems long before many times many of the vehicles have even seen production we're already in that repair process talking about things like body filler. Okay, so moving on here, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the three legs of corrosion protection is how I refer to it. And Jason, I want to propose to your, to your uh, crew here or your, to, to our viewers, um, when I say the three legs of corrosion protection, what does that mean? What three things, after we've done our bonding, okay, and after we've got our body filler here, there are actually three more legs to truly prevent corrosion protection does anybody know what they are? And while we're waiting for a few of the people to, to kind of toss that up in, into the chat here, um, I do want to uh, mention that when we're talking about corrosion protection and preventing corrosion protection, I saw an image sent by one of our sales reps just the other day where they did body work on a vehicle. They wrapped it in plastic, they pulled it outside and it was raining like it is here today and I'm, like it is down there um, you know, in Arkansas with you guys. And really, when you wrap that panel in plastic, you're creating a greenhouse effect underneath that plastic. And so you're getting condensation, moisture that's now being trapped against that metal surface, even if you're using crash wrap. So we see this a lot where they crash wrap it, they park it outside because they don't have room in the shop, it hasn't been primed yet, they come inside, they think that they can pull the plastic off and then they can just wipe it down and they can prime it. You're getting that, that flash oxidization on the surface that's going to lead to corrosion down the, down the road, and you're not gonna see it right away. This is where the customers will come back and the body filler has, has cracked, it's peeled, it's chipping, you start sanding it away, and the first, first knee-jerk reaction is, well, 3M's body filler is bad because it all rusted underneath it, and like I said, the picture that I got from one of our sales reps this week, it was very like, whoa, uh, please tell them that they need to take this car back in and, and readdress that. So Jason, anybody uh, reply to our question about what are the three legs of corrosion protection? So we've got a couple answers here. Um, we've got um, one that says heat, moisture, and air, and one that says anode, cathode, and electrolyte. I'm not sure if that's where you're going for your question okay, wow. or if you're looking for corrosion protection. Yeah, so that's so that's good. I mean, that that's excellent. So along with those three legs, I want to talk about the three legs to prevent corrosion, and that's what we're moving into here next. And the first one I want to talk about is seam sealers and understanding that seam sealers play a critical role in the prevention of corrosion um, in the repair aftermarket. And many OEMs have repair procedures, have bulletins out there and available. The FCA, they have guidelines that specifically will call out the fact that even if the vehicle did not have seam sealer from the factory, you need to have seam sealer in the aftermarket. So when you get that new door and it doesn't have seam sealer on it, and you look at the car and you say, well, originally it didn't have seam sealer on it, the bulletin that they've put out there says, no, 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 in order to ensure corrosion protection, we need to make sure that you seam seal that door. They go on further to say, you know, replicate the original look and appearance or where one is not apparent, seam seal the hem flange in discrete fashion, right? And that's just one example of many that we've found, you know, in the industry. And, and I wanna emphasize, they're not always in the specific repair procedure. So our estimators, our blueprinters, our technicians, they need to be aware that these OEMs have additional bulletins available to find this information. And when they put out these bulletins, most often they're a blanket statement for all model vehicles within their uh, manufactured lines, right? So like Toyota's got them, uh, Honda has them. They're referring to all their vehicles unless there's a specific change within the e exact repair procedure itself. So when it comes to seam sealers and actually applying them you know, to the vehicle, and I will say before I started this video here, I not only equalized the cartridge, but I need to also address the fact that we always want to be make sure we're wearing our safety equipment. So you see me, I'm putting on my safety glasses here now. So safety glasses are extremely important. Many cases you need to be wearing a respirator. 
So always make sure you're wearing the proper respirator for the material you're using. If you need to be wearing uh, cut resistant gloves, you'll also see me here today using some nitrile gloves. We want to make sure that in all repair scenarios that we are wearing the appropriate PPE. If you're not familiar with it, you know, look in the SDS uh, for the products that you're using. Also check with your local regulations and state regulations as they vary from state to state. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're, that we're always safe um, and following the repair procedures at the same time. So when we talk about seam sealer, one of the things that comes up a lot is they want to jump right into like that OEM replication. And you got to realize that there's two functions of seam sealers. There's the function of actually sealing the seam, and then there's OEM bead replication. And what that means here, I'm going to move this respirator out of the way so Kevin can come in and uh, see this here. So what that actually means is I will have, say, a seam that I need to be sealing, and I come in, and I'm going to make sure I brush it out first, okay? This is going to be sealing that overlap panel, that hem flange, that weld area to prevent against corrosion. Now, I'm going to have Kevin back up here because one of the other things, Jason, as you know, um, I really like the commentary that we get on social media quite often. And, and we've got a lot of videos out there as far as OEM bead replication. And one of the things that I, I commonly hear is, well, you guys do all these videos and you always do them on a tabletop. I never see you apply them to an actual vehicle. And Jason, you were here and we've filmed many of those via, you know, videos. And I thought, I thought the same thing. But as you guys all know, setting up and moving camera equipment can be quite difficult. So really, the way I like to demo this and showing you know, applications of stuff like the Caterpillar bead. What's that? is I'll just hold, I'll hold the panel up and I'll actually just apply it vertically. And I'm showing this, like the strength of our product and making sure that you're choosing the right Forgot product. About that. Moving around and it. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're choosing the right product for the you know right process. And I'm going to set this back down here because I want to talk one more. I want to go one step further here with this discussion and talk about direct to metal seam sealers. Now the seam sealer that I used here is not considered a direct to metal seam sealer, but in many cases we see shops that will make the decision to use direct to metal seam sealers. And I need to also preface this. I'm not saying bare metal seam sealers, direct to metal seam sealers are bad. I'm not saying bare metal products are bad products. Okay. We make them here. We sell them to you. But what we see is the misuse or misapplication in some cases, and it's not intentional, right? And I'm going to show you a couple examples of, you know, what is important when we're talking about preventing corrosion, right? We're talking foundational buildup here so that when the customer picks up the vehicle, it doesn't um, run into any problems. And so really, I'm going to have Kevin come back in here and, and take a look at this. When we're talking about this, this uh, seam sealer bead here, right? I've got a pretty high lofty bead. In a lot of cases, we've got, you know, um, very thick, very dense seam sealer applications on vehicles. Toyota is infamous for this. Uh, Hyundai's, they have a lot of this stuff too. And you can see along this edge here, you know, there's, there's the possibility that if I don't get my paint gun all the way around there, I'm not going to have appropriate coverage on that surface, right? I'm not going to have all that bare metal covered. And, and really what I'm talking about is when they paint the panel, Okay, and you come back out of paint, it looks like we've got good coverage, right? We've got it in and around the seam sealer. But what happens in many cases, and again, it's not intentional, it's just kind of by default. I will give the painters a break here. They can't always get in and paint every area. And as a body man myself, there's nothing better than picking on painters. But in this case here, a lot of times they can't get into some of these tight areas and make sure that all that bare metal is covered. So a fun fact here, um, you know, most paint companies have tech data sheets um, for the products and what needs to be applied and how many coats, what size atomizing head and so forth. That is so that they can prevent corrosion, you know, and make sure that that final application does not lead the or leave the vehicle in um, danger of having corrosion. One of these areas where this is very important and, and is also a good representation of this is like a wheel arch. Okay. A lot of vehicles have that same sealer on that wheel arch and it's not necessarily to protect that that uh, hemmed over flange um, or that you know pinch weld um, and so forth but it's actually to help aid against rock chipping and stone chipping along that edge where the wheel is really throwing a lot of that road debris and everything else up there and I like to use the example of you know say it's four you know Friday afternoon it's two o'clock and you're about to ship that vehicle back to the customer 
and you've got three hours of reassembly and they're showing up at four o'clock, if you don't have a reason to pull the wheel off and take a look behind here, you're not going to, right? Let's be honest. We got to get these cars put back together. We still have to wash them. We have to calibrate them. We have to scan them. Um, and this is where, and I'm going to have Kevin come in on this. This is where we see the most common failure with direct to metal seam sealers is that critical edge that gets missed because maybe they didn't take the wheel off when they painted it. And because of that, the paint gun couldn't get back in here and apply the right amount of, of paint material. And now we've got a bare metal edge in a very corrosive, you know, high risk area. And this is really where when I go out and see customers or I feel complaints from the, from the field, this is one of the applications that I see a lot of the time. Okay, so when we go further down the path and we start talking to people and they say, well, I'm not using any, um, you know, bare metal seam sealers. I've been listening to what you have to say. One of the questions I want to throw out there to the, to the audience here, Jason, is, you know, do the OEMs say anything about surface preparation prior to the application of seam sealers? All right, and this goes along that same line of, again, so, you know, do the OEMs, do they have any bulletins? Do they talk about it, repair procedures as far as preparing the surface prior to the application of seam sealers? I'm going to give it just a couple seconds here and, and see what we come up with. But really, when, we, when we're talking about bare metal, Again, that is the most critical areas in and around all those edges. They have to be completely covered you know, with material to really truly prevent corrosion. And it's not that the product is bad, it's that the application or the repair, the rest of the repair process doesn't lend itself to making sure those surfaces get covered. So this is where communication becomes very important. Preventing corrosion might, need, might mean a few extra conversations between our body department and our paint department to let them know where there's exposed bare metal. Or maybe a painter sees a body guy or a body gal doing a repair and says, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be able to paint that afterwards. So we better make sure we get the proper coating on it now before you get it seam sealed and we get it up there while I have access to that, to that spot. So Jason, anybody throw anything in the, in the comment there about um, using bare metal seams or sorry, surface preparation um, prior to applying seam sealers? Yeah, the only one that I've got here says that um, most often they just see it says apply the seam sealer. Does it not a lot of preparation information? Okay, excellent. So, and a lot of times they say that right in the repair procedure. But if you go into the bulletins, and I like, I really like Crib 186. Um, Honda released one back in March of 2021. Um, FCA has the, in that same pre refinished guidelines, they mention this as well. But Toyota Crib 186 plain and simply calls it out and says, do not apply seam sealers directly to bare metal. Three paragraphs prior to where they actually list that, they talk about what is an acceptable primer to be used. And they specifically say that an etching primer cannot exhibit the original corrosion prevention characteristics of an e-coat or factory paint over the long term. Therefore, you need to use a 2K epoxy or a 2K urethane primer. I'm sorry on that. Toyota does not call it a 2K urethane primer. They only call it an epoxy primer. My mistake. Um, this is where some confusion comes into the industry because technicians will say, okay, I hear your messaging. I, you know, I want to prevent corrosion. So I'm not putting seam sealers over bare metal, but I'm using them over a primer. And then the next part of the conversation is really what primers are we putting them on and what primers are we putting them over? So I'm going to have Kevin, um, zoom in here again. And, and Jason, you can attest to this on Monday when we spoke, I had you, um, give me some names. And unfortunately I wrote two names down right away or the same name on two panels right away. So I've got three panels here that I've coated with a primer and they all look to be relatively the same. Okay. And if anybody wants to challenge me on this, go ahead and message Jason because he watched me do it. Yeah. Um, again, there's I, really I no hocus pocus it. going on here. <laughs> yeah. Cause no I think I took Jason off guard on. when I, so all I have here is our, our high powered spray gun cleaner. So these panels to, to be full transparency, I sanded them with the 220 get, 220 grit Cubitron 2 DA disc. I cleaned them, I sprayed them, I put them through a bake cycle, and then we got on the phone with Jason after they were dry and I wrote on here with a Sharpie marker. And the strength of the product itself, and I followed the tech data sheet for the appropriate number of coats, the amount of flash off time. And if three days later, with using some high powered spray gun cleaner, I can just wash that off. It really has some concern for me as far as like, Will this protect the vehicle for the life of the vehicle after I make my repair? So that's one example, but not to pick on one particular brand or company. You know, we can do this with several. You look how fast that one came off of here, and I'm not going to tell you which ones these are. Um, again, I'm not picking on any company. I'm picking on a process, all right? 
This one here was sprayed with a 2K. This was a 2K primer. And to show the strength of it, you can see, I can even take Holly's name right off the panel. But now I know that this primer is, is tight. It's rock solid. But to go one step further, we do a lot of testing here in the lab. And we coat these panels. And when we have um, technicians actually come through our training program, so actually, if uh, Kenny Coates is watching, I have your panel here from two years ago. It never got chipped to you. So I apologize. Send me a message. I'll send it back to you. But so Kenny Coates, we prime, when he comes in here for training and uh, in our three-day program, they actually get to put on the 2K epoxy primer on this side. And then I put it through the minimum required test. And Kenny sprayed a 1K primer on this side. And this is the, it went through a salt fog bath and it's the minimum requirement. It's an ASTM B117. If you want to have some fun and look it up and read it, you know, more power to you. It's a, not many people like reading repair procedures. I doubt you're going to really like reading a 14 page test method and understanding what it says. But again, if this is what the strength of a 1K is long term, and again, I'm not, this, to be completely transparent, this is a 3M 1K product. And then I get the, accused a lot of people saying, well, you're doing it, and, you know, you can put them in the tank in a funny position, and you can alter that. So here's an example of a panel that had a 1K on one side, seam sealer down the middle, and then 2K on this side, right? So trying to eliminate any of that hocus pocus magic that, you know, people often accuse me of and say like, well, you're just doing this stuff because you can, you're 3M and you're just making it look cute and pretty. Um, we've had several technicians um, over the last few years come through. They build these panels, we ship them back. And this really emphasizes, again, that preventing corrosion starts at the foundational level, protecting that metal before we're putting anything up on top of it, right? And again, the OEMs, like Sean mentioned several times yesterday, and I know, you know, Jason, you guys down there at Collision Hub, you're out in shops constantly and you're reinforcing the fact that we have to follow these OEM procedures. And I always say we also have to follow the bulletins that go along with the vehicles because this is where we do truly find additional information that takes us all the way through the end of the repair and truly preventing against corrosion long term. All right. So that was just a, a real quick example. When we talk about our seam sealers at 3M here, we, our recommendation is always, including bare metal seam sealers, always put them over a 2K epoxy primer, right? And we say that, we also reference a 2K urethane primer, and I'm not gonna get into the logistics or the argument over which one's better or which one's not, but most often you're gonna see all the OEMs calling out a 2K epoxy primer for a reason, all right? Because we can't be putting seam sealers over etching primers, even 2K etching primers. And definitely, as you saw here, there's really no strength. So Kevin, zoom in one more time. So I actually have Holly's panel here sitting in all of that cleaner since we moved that off to the side and poor Holly's name is going away. But we still have that protection on the panel. I know anything that's applied over the top of this is gonna hold up long term. All right, so when we get into one more misconception with, with uh, seam sealers, how they're applied and, and how they should be used, you know, we get a lot of inquiries about OEM bead replication. 1K seam sealers, everybody assumes that they're really hard. You know, they take a long time to dry. And there's actually a scientific way in which they cure even after they've been painted um, so that they'll, full, they'll, they'll cure fully. And one of the things I want to show here, Jason, with the crew again, is because I get a lot of, I, I don't get, I see, you know, technicians will say, well, you guys are always doing it on a bench top. Please do it on a vehicle. So I'll let you guys look at my bald spot here while I apply this material. And I got the air pressure way up. So I'm actually going to turn this down so I can get a more appropriate bead like I want. And so if I can do this while I'm on a camera holding the board and applying it and talking to you guys up over my head and it's not dripping, falling or sagging, right? And I can get that rippled look and appearance and I put it over a 2K epoxy primer, right? This is where the strength is going to come in. And this is where we're really gonna round out that, that corrosion protection ability of replicating the original look and appearance like I mentioned with that FCA comment or with that bulletin, we're gonna be talking about making sure it's over a 2K epoxy primer, right? So let's put it over a 2K epoxy primer. 
make sure we've got that corrosion protection. We've brushed out our material and now we've applied our seam sealer. We're really truly getting that corrosion protection right from the beginning. All right, so moving right along here, Jason. Go ahead, you got a question? Yeah, I got a question for you. You know, you, you talked about the, the primer under the seam sealer and this has been a question that I've been getting for 25 years. Um, why is it that there still is confusion around, around that? Do you have any insight into why that might be? I'm sorry, around which part of the primer? I might've missed the very front first part of that. Just you said there's confusion putting, around the primer. About putting primer underneath the seam sealer. Again, we've been getting that question for forever. You know, I've got a direct to metal, you know, seam sealer. Why do I need to put primer on there? You know, why, why do we still have that question out there? Again, you've talked about it ad nauseum and it's been around for a long time. You know, do you have any insight into why people are still questioning that? Yeah, so like I said, Honda actually came out with the bulletin. Toyota has it. FCA mentions it in their repair refinish guidelines. And what we're really trying to do is replicate or, or you know, we can't duplicate. So we're trying to replicate that e-coat process that was originally done from the factory. Because from the factory, all the vehicles are completely assembled. All the metal and aluminum steel, you know, components are bonded, fasted, fastened, bolted on. And then it goes through an e-coat bath before any seam sealers are applied. And this is where they're getting the corrosion protection, optimal corrosion protection from. The way we can replicate that in the aftermarket, restoring that original eco protection, as I mentioned in that Crib 186 Toyota Bulletin, you know, the only way to, for Toyota's, you know, per their uh, bulletin, the only way to restore that factory eco protection is a 2K epoxy primer. Now, one thing that I do have to say to go one step further about, you know, this discussion is it's not my job. It's not 3M's job to change your shop's SOPs or processes. Okay, that's not the intent here and I'm not trying to do that. What it is our job to do is provide you with the most information, the most accurate and up-to-date information to address the issue. You know, what do the OEMs recommend? It is up to your shop, if not called out specifically by an OEM, it is still up to your shop to make that final decision. But in the case of Toyota, if you're working on Toyota vehicles and that bulletin is out there and exists and it does, and you don't have epoxy primer on your mixing bank, my first question is, how are you repairing any Toyota vehicles? And that's Toyota, Lexus, and Scion, right? If you're on a Toyota repair program and you are a certified repair facility and you don't have epoxy primer, how are you repairing these vehicles properly? Because they tell you right there, and this bulletin has been around for more than 15 years. Like I said, Hondas, they just released theirs in 2021, and they went through extensive testing to find out how can we replicate that original corrosion protection, right? So when it comes to primers, and that's where it gets into like, okay, so one case, two case, speed is king in our industry. In many cases, you know, our technicians are paid on commission. Um, insurance companies are, I'm hearing they're, they're pulling back on their metrics of gauging shops on cycle times and everything else um, due to the shortage of technicians. If you're a shop that's, you know, um, not playing that game, congratulations, I love it. Absolutely love to hear it, Chris, and I love seeing when you post up there that a shop is following the procedures first, doing what's right for the customer and the vehicle, and you know, insurance company be pushed aside. Um, personally, I'll stand behind that 100%. Here at 3M, we're always gonna stand behind what the OEMs say, because again, they're the experts on how the vehicle was built and should be reconstructed in the event of an accident. That was a long-winded answer. I hope I addressed it for you, Jason. You're good, thank you. <laughs> As you can see, I'm very passionate about this topic, and, and it's something that, like I said, the 20 plus years that I've been in this industry, I think it'll be 24 years this fall that I've actually been in the industry and working here at 3M. Um, this is an area that I've always felt very passionately about um, and, and really want to be able to provide that education to the industry and, and really bring this industry back up. So moving on, so we talked about that first leg of preventing corrosion after we've done our bonding and our structural adhesives and our body filler work, you know, before it goes to the paint shop. And now we're gonna talk about another leg and this is external coatings, right? So the first leg was seam sealers. Second leg was external coatings. And this is where we're gonna get into our rock guards, our chip guards and under coatings. Um, it might be called other things, gravel coatings, uh, gravel guards, uh, so forth. Might be bed liners involved. But this is really where we're adding that extra layer of protection. And I'm not gonna show you any demos here today. 
Um, Brady is down there. You will see guys, you'll see Brady tomorrow on his presentation. He'll be talking about the new uh, performance spray gun um, and its ability to, you know, for transfer efficiency, the ability to spray multiple coatings, including high viscosity coatings. I will say when it comes to matching some of these difficult textures and appearances like Tesla, okay, Tesla is one that we get a lot of questions about what products and what processes. This is the application system that we recommend you use. And for additional information on that, reach out to your, your sales rep, your distribution person, or us here at 3M. We got information on our website and so forth about matching using our systems, these textures, looks, and appearances while providing that corrosion protection. And really, I want to highlight one thing that I see commonly, again, going on that, you know, what happens if we see a failure? And it's simply rushing the application where they're trying to pound on three coats right away within a five minute period, or they're just not getting enough material on there. Our tech data sheets talk about how much material, how many coats and so forth that need to be applied because our testing that we've done here in the lab, the testing that we've done with the OEMs for all the products that are called out by the OEMs um, show that this is the minimum requirement to actually meet that standard set by the OEMs um, to restore that vehicle's corrosion protection and inevitably its pre-accident crash worthiness. So external coatings, that's a you know, secondary leg of, of preventing against that corrosion. And we're gonna move into like the last and final area here and, and really what I think is, is probably the most important um, and, and really is missed most often in the repair process. And that is cavity wax. And so I wanna bring in a couple frame rail examples here um, that we've made up. And I wanna talk about corrosion protection, particularly in and around these weld zones, you know, in these pinch weld areas here, because when you're looking at them on a vehicle, you know, you're looking at them from this angle when you're putting them back together, right? So this is a, you know, replication of a typical frame rail, say this might be a front section on a, uh, I think Toyota, or even like a, let's say a, an Alexis ES350, they have a procedure for sectioning that front frame rail. This is kind of a representation of that. And one of the things that I see, one of the mistakes that I see in the industry is when a, a shop will grab a paint gun, they, even if they put a 2K epoxy primer in here, they've got their frame rail set up, they stick the paint gun in the end, they pull the trigger with it at about 40 PSI and they wiggle it around a whole lot and they say, well, now we've definitely got protection here, right? And that's not what the OEMs want to be done. In fact, Nissan calls this out specifically in their procedures and they say in order to restore corrosion protection if you can't access it and get at it with ease and apply appropriately you know top coated paints or materials only use a cavity wax right some some uh, oems call them an inner panel rust proofing inner inner panel rust preventive preventative material um, here at 3m our cavity wax plus is the material that's recommended and i want to highlight here jason because we've had some questions come out and we sort of just um i don't want to say slipped it out into the industry, but we built it with the specific intent in mind. Um, and it went over really well. And we get a lot of questions about technicians saying, you know, your, your legacy product, your 88852 Cavity Wax Plus is a phenomenal product. But really when it comes to post repair inspections, there's certain e-coat colors that it becomes very difficult to see on. So we went back to the bench and we started playing around and we came up with this concept. And we did a bunch of field testing. We created another cavity wax. This is cavity wax plus amber. It's 38854. And this product here can be used for um, difficult, you know, areas that, well, let me rotate that. What am I doing here? There we go. I'm doing it all backwards. Jason and Kristen are laughing at me. I know they are. Um, <laughs> so these are our two. <laughs> These are our two Cavity Wax Plus products. We've got our, our traditional uh, beige or opaque transparent color. This matches a lot of the OEM originally applied uh, Cavity Waxes. And we also now offer uh, Cavity Wax Plus Amber. And Amber is what I'm gonna be using here today for our demonstration purposes and showing you like, what is it about Cavity Wax that really protects all these metal surfaces? Because it's more than just you know putting it into the vehicle um, and walking away. We need to know why we're using this product or why it's called out. Okay, so my first question to the audience here, Jason, is, is it important for cavity wax to remain where it's been applied? All right, so I'm gonna get a couple things set up here while, while our uh, lovely audience is answering that question for us. 
And I started doing this demo a couple years ago. And again, I'm going to bring out a competitive product here. I'm not going to tell you who it is. Um, the can's been completely concealed. And yes, that's yellow tape. So don't try to look into the color of the product. Um, to be fair, I'm also going to take out a brand new wand kit that's designed for this material. And these are really cute, aren't they? They come all coiled like this. They're really, look at that. It's just, yeah, that's really awesome. So we're going to set this one up here. Now, I also put these on the shaker prior to starting this demo because I didn't want you guys to sit and listen to a rattle can in my microphone. And as part of this demo, I'm going to take out a used wand of 3Ms. Okay. Jason, you want to hear something funny? You remember when you were back up here in 2019? Yeah. Okay, so this demo, <clears throat> this was the wand that was used in that demo. So three years later, countless number of training sessions with end users, videos and otherwise, I'm still using this same cavity wax wand. So realistically, I've got my competitor here at, a, at an advantage. So Jason, I want you to, number one, let's go back to the question. Is it important for cavity wax to stay where it's applied inside the vehicle? What do you, did anybody reply to that one? Well, I, you know, they're looking for having the cavity wax in most of the areas it was applied, but wanting some, some creep as well. Perfect. So I hear from a lot of shops, I know I've got enough in the vehicle when it's running out onto the floor. Then I know I've got enough in there and I got all the op, you know, optimal corrosion protection. My first question is what, who pays for the stuff that's on the floor? So you're right, you do want some creep and I'm gonna show you that in a second here, but I'm gonna actually use the 3M product first. And Jason, I want you to pick a bottle um, from your point of view, so it'd be opposite of mine, right side or left side? Again, trying to avoid uh, that my, hocus pocus magic. My right, your left. All right, so this is the one we're going to put there the 3M cavity wax in. And our, rec our recommendation is three coats. And we actually call out letting it flash after the second coat before applying the third coat. But I'm going to go wet on wet on wet because who, have, who actually reads the tech data sheets after all, right? I mean, we spent all that time writing it. Why would you read it? So as we're looking at this, this bottle here, I want you to picture this as being our weld. And I'm going to make a mark on this one over here too, okay? And I'm going to come in and I'm going to apply this competitive product. And on the can and on their website and on their tech data sheet, they say apply one heavy coat. So I'm going to try to get the wand in here as centered as I can because it's all curly cued. And we're going to apply what I would consider to be one heavy coat. And we can argue semantics later of it. But here's one heavy coat of cavity wax. And according to their product and their process. Now we know we've got optimal corrosion protection to protect this, this repair. Um, because we know we've got enough because it's running out all over the floor, right? Now I know I've got enough in there. It's important for cavity wax to stay where you've applied it because we need to be able to protect these weld zones um, in these repairs. This is going to go into the next part of the, the process that I'm going to show you guys. So I'm going to take these bottles and throw them away. I will say that Within about 15 minutes, you will see some drippage coming out of here as the foamingness subsides, though this product actually is designed to foam. I can't tell you what's in it, it's trademarked, but um, we, we do actually design it to foam a little bit. And I hear that from some customers when they say, well, I don't like your cavity wax because it foams. And I'm gonna show you in a second why that's actually important, but you can see it's staying and holding in a water bottle that isn't designed, the plastic isn't designed to hold anything. So I'm gonna throw this away. And I'm going to flip this over and we're going to move on to the next. So now that we've talked about making sure it stays where we applied it, we're going to get out my fancy little frame rail here. So everybody's seen the 360 bottle demo and that's, that's a great demo. But um, really, I like to be as relevant to what our customers are doing on a daily basis. And to prove my point, Jason, I'm going to take and I'm going to mark with a Sharpie marker on here to show you that these surfaces are dry. Again, I got no hocus pocus. I'm not trying to pull the wool over on anybody and I'm not trying to fudge the results of our demo here today. So we're gonna close this up. So I've got, I've got holes drilled here in the end um, to represent sort of that end of the frame rail. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our Cavity Wax Plus Amber material here, and I'm going to apply three different coats. I'm going to try to get this one coat, or uh, yeah, one coat, two coats, three coats, so that you guys can see. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do three coats, two coats, one coat, no coat. Oh, you got hung up. So we've got gusset plates inside here to represent, because this is what our technicians are dealing with on a on a day to day basis, right? There's all these locations and areas where we don't. So there's two coats. And there's three coats. All right. So now 3M recommends three coats with our product. And the reason why we recommend that three coat application is simply because a lot of OEMs, Subaru in particular, they have a minimum rating as far as how much cavity wax needs to be applied in each and every repair, including door panels, but how much material needs to stay on that surface for the life of the vehicle. So while the customers are driving around, they don't want it to be running out and dripping all over the place. But that foamingness I had mentioned Okay, this is designed for a reason. So you can see all the wet material on these vertical surfaces. So this is where that Sharpie marker was. You can see it's wiping it off and I'm pulling it off here on my fingers. That foamingness, right? That, that ability to touch all these vertical surfaces when, when being applied inside that frame rail is extremely important for a couple of reasons. One, we're covering all the bare metal. And two, I'm gonna have Kevin swing over here and take a look at the at our wicking demo. So if you guys remember, I set this demo up at the very beginning here. So it's been about, what, 30 minutes, a little over 30 minutes. And I'm going to see if I can get the light just right for Kevin. There we go. So you can see the materials wicking up inside here. And it's, and it's, I love this demo because it's different every time. Like the steel plate may have gotten dropped. Um, there might be something different about the way it's clamped, but anywhere where it's not tightly clamped, you can see that there's material coming all the way up in behind this clip, you can see there's material that's come up all the way in behind here. And this is where in these weld zones, so when you go back to this frame rail example here, this is where and how in all these weld zones, so these pinch weld areas, these upper weld zones itself, this is why when we say we apply it, it actually foams up so it touches all those metal surfaces and then it allows to start wicking. And what that's what you saw here in the little Larry coupon was the wicking capability of the cavity wax to work its way up in these zones. And that's why it's actually important for it to stay for a period of time until that foamingness subsides and that uh, residue or that material can work its way down into the lower crevices as well. The important thing here to point out is we wanna make sure that you know we're clearing all of the lower, so if there's a drain hole or something down in here, we're clearing all that out prior to delivering the vehicle. Cavity wax needs to be applied during the reassembly process, right? Before we wash the vehicle, before we're gonna deliver it, don't hammer it in there after it's been washed and right before you deliver it. Um, we need to make sure that we're, we're really getting that, the, uh, the protection in there um, on all these, not only repaired areas, but replacement panels, paintless dent repair work, anywhere, and some OEMs will like go you know, in and describe it as anywhere that the e-coat has been disrupted, right? So. When we get into um, these types of applications, this is one area that we see um, technicians asking like, well, why doesn't yours run right away? I like the product that runs and, and that's, that's important. But one other question that we get quite a bit that I wanna show is the, the debate of, do I put the foam in first or do I put the cavity wax in first? You know, which one do I do? So again, going back to like, you know, frame rail Chrysler uh, there and, I like picking on Chrysler. I drive one to be fair. I don't know if that's fair or not, but they love their foam inside their vehicles, right? Anybody that's ever cut a quarter panel off, a rocker panel off, a rear body panel off, especially like the old uh, Grand Caravans, right? They got that thing just loaded with foam from the striker plates down. And we get a lot of questions about this. They'll put a quarter panel on and they'll say, do I put the cavity wax in there first and then I come back in with the foam? Um, as far as 3M goes in our process and our recommendation, we want you to put the foam in first prior to it um, being painted. And then we want you to, after it's been painted, go in and put the cavity wax. And this is where you're gonna get your protection 
and barrier around the edges and the surfaces of the foam. And one of the reasons why that is, is because if we apply cavity wax first and the foam happens to break loose because now we've prevented it from bonding to that substrate. You can see here on this panel, the only place that we got any type of bonding with the foam is directly where I put the um, mixing nozzle and, and applied it right into the wet cavity wax. The rest of it has broken completely clean. And why this is important is imagine, you know, you didn't get it directly in there because how often do you have direct access to apply these foams and it expands and it doesn't have anything to bond to and now it breaks loose and now it's going to be rubbing inside that panel and it doesn't matter if you have cavity wax in there, it's going to be scratching the heck out of it and exposing that metal substrate. Whereas if you put the, the foam in first, you can see how much uh, cohesive failure we have inside this panel. It's all up on the edges um, here. And yes, there's, there's rust on my example panel because there's no cavity wax. That wasn't the point of the, of the example or the demo, but you can see how the adhesive from the foam was allowed to bond to that surface. Whereas on this panel here, if you look at that inner edge, all you see is cavity wax in there, right? And so that's really the difference. If I get that tip just right, this is like working backwards in a mirror. It's pretty difficult. There we go. So you can see on this edge, like right here, uh, or actually this thumb over here, you can see on that edge where the, you know, the foam was allowed to adhere to that surface. So the, the, the general application recommendation from 3M in this case is foam or cavity wax first. You're gonna put the foam in first. The cavity wax goes in during the reassembly process prior to washing and delivering um, the vehicle. So. One more thing here, quick, Jason, before we wrap this up, I got one more question to, to kind of toss out to the audience here. And we talked about, you know, the product, the application of cavity wax, and really this is the last step in that, you know, the three legs to truly prevent corrosion protection. And one of the questions I get is how much should I use, right? And this is where I want to post a question up to your, to your audience of who is mine? And when I say mine, I say who is 3M's largest competitor in cavity wax? whether you call it cavity wax, inner panel rust proof, or whatever the name is, who is my largest competitor? Who is 3M's largest competitor? I'm gonna give you guys just a second to throw that up in the chat here. Um, because what we found is we went out and we did a study um, when we launched Cavity Wax Plus back in, in 2016. And we wanted to find out how much was required for each repair. And even though we couldn't like narrow it down specifically per vehicle, per make, per panel, as the models were changing, it was very difficult to track. We did a study and we based it on the low end of our findings because we wanted to be fair. We, and when we did the study, we had a lot of insurance companies pushing back saying, well, you're just telling us that because you want to sell more product. So on the low end of the study, we came up with a rating. And I'm going to tell you what it is here in just a second. Jason, any replies back to the, the question about who they think my biggest competitor in Cavity Wax is? We don't have any replies, but, uh, oh, we do have one reply. Uh, we, had, we had one person say value guard. And I have a guess. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess people not applying cavity wax is your biggest competitor. You're spot on, man. You are spot on. It's not even another brand, it's not even another product. I'm gonna be honest with you, not the one that was mentioned. There are other products out of the marketplace. If you actually like they'll buy them off of convenience websites, they won't even get them necessarily through distribution. That on the cans themselves, and especially in the tech data sheets on page two, if you go to paragraph four. It actually says you have to reapply annually to provide the corrosion protection stated in this document. So I wanna propose another question. How many of you guys watching this are gonna call your customers back annually to prevent corrosion? <laughs> and how many of them do you think are gonna show up for that application and process? Um, probably not many. But during our study, when we, were, when we were going through this and we were investigating our cavity wax wands and our, our kits and everything else, what we found was on the low end of the average, you know, as long as you're not fixing like bumper covers, replacing headlights and working on, you know, just miscellaneous plastic parts, as long as you're doing any type of repair, that includes hammering, cutting, welding, uh, paintless dent repair, anywhere where the e-coat is disrupted and disturbed, technicians should be using one can per technician per week. So if you're operating with a shop of five guys, right, and you're meeting sort of that average efficiency across the industry, you know, you guys should be going through about five cans a week. Now that's gonna vary a little bit depending on the type of repair. But when we did our study, and actually I followed back up with this last summer um, during our, you know, so one of my COVID projects was, I wanted to find out from our customers today how much they're using. 
And in many cases, whether they were using a 3M product or a non-3M product, we were falling short of usage by about 50%. And that's really an alarming number to me um, personally because it's like this is a critical step. And the most common application that I see missed that I've had several complaints on has been the Chevy box side. If you get to step 9 or 12, depending on which repair you're doing, it actually calls out an inner panel rust proofing material to be used. In that case, Cavity Wax Plus. Right, needs to be put in there because this is how we're gonna, again, replicate that original e-coat look and appearance from the factory. So, um, guys, that's all I really have for you guys today. If there's not any questions, I do have a couple follow-ups if we got some additional time to fill here, Jason. But um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and, and throw them up in the chat right now. Um, I'd like to just throw out there real quick. Additionally, if you have any questions after the fact, you can still submit them. Um, Jason, Kristen, they have direct contacts, they can get in touch with me. I also encourage you to reach out to your 3M rep. If you don't know who they are, we can get you in touch with them. Um, but if you do know who they are, I know they love hearing from you guys and we can't always get to everybody every week, but we definitely try to. Um, there's a lot of shops out there in the world and we're trying to make sure that everybody's making you know, proper repairs and restoring the vehicle back to its pre-accident crash worthiness. So Jason, I'm gonna toss it back to you. Do you got any questions or follow-ups coming in that, that we wanna cover before we uh, close out the session? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one you kind of touched on a little bit, but I'm going to read the whole thing anyways, and you can kind of finish the second part of it. Uh, does 3M recommend any replication of cavity wax after the vehicle has been on the road for a period of time? Or does 3M have any recommendation on the time that cavity wax offers corrosion protection? Excellent question. So to answer the first one, yes. So this, this one actually does come up quite a bit. I've cut my quarter panel off. There's rust on the inside. Um, you know, do I need to put a cavity wax in there or do I have to try to get in there and clean that out? And even though cavity wax will not stop rust, okay, it's not going to convert it, it's not going to, you know, change it over and, and prevent it from continuing to grow, it will greatly slow it down if properly applied. Okay, we're creating that sealed barrier. We're not allowing any additional new moisture or air to work its way into that surface and to continue to oxidize. So, yes, if there's corrosion in there, um, Jason, as an example, you know, I mentioned I drive a Dodge. I drive a Dodge Durango. I bought it two years old. And the first thing I did with 35,000 miles on it was I went and put seven cans of cavity wax in that truck. A um, little overboard, you know, probably could have gotten away with five, but I like going overboard with just about everything I do. And so I made sure that I had that thing completely filled. And I actually put it up on a lift uh, about a month ago and climbed, you know, under and around it and inspected it and took a look. And there ain't anything going on underneath there. So I'm very excited and very happy about that. Um, to address the second question, as far as, boy, you're going to have to remind me, I just drew a blank. What was the second question, Jason? Yeah, no, for, uh, does 3M have any recommendation of time that the cavity wax offers corrosion protection? How long is it good for? Oh, excellent. So we say with our, if you use our cavity wax plus appropriately, we say it, it will surpass 1,500 hours in that salt fog test right that's kind of like that minimum industry requirement and everybody always wants to know like what does that 1500 relate to and and loosely translated that's about seven to two, for every 500 hours which is the minimum uh time that you have to be in that test is equivalent to about seven to ten years of driving conditions in, in a harsh environment so our product will extend that out you will get you know the life of the vehicle and possibly more you know i will say through my own testing i know i have far surpassed that number um, but I will say that of all the products and, and, you know, other brands on the marketplace, um, being that I work for 3M, there are some others that do perform very well. Um, but I haven't found anybody that's been able to, you know, really truly outperform us, um, in that test. So, okay. uh, another question on your, uh, 1k, uh, dispenser, uh, do you have a part number on that by chance? And as well as a wide tip, so there's some part numbers you have handy or maybe we can follow up later. Yeah, so the, the applicator itself is $83.99 and the tip or the nozzle is, uh, oh boy, $81.88. Okay. I think that's right. Kevin, it's actually on that. I think I got a box on that table if I'm not mistaken. Todd's helping me out. Eighty-one eighty-eight. All right, confirmed. So the nozzle's eighty-one eighty-eight. The applicator is eighty-three ninety-nine, and that applicator Perfect. fits the sausage pack materials. Okay. 
Um, I don't have any other questions. Do you have a couple of comments here? Just uh, one great information, thanks. And uh, one that we would certainly agree with here, um, Ryan is the best. So I'm guessing that's not the same person that said you're the most punchable face in the collision industry. That's someone that's a, you had a fan there instead. So you want to know, um, but yeah, we, so Jason, <laughs> I almost took that poster out of my office and hung it on the wall back here for this presentation. <laughs> but I was really worried about the, the name of the person who posted it and the language used might not be appropriate for some audiences. So <laughs> I refrained from pulling it down, but I do have that as a full three by five poster on my office. And the guys behind the cameras here are laughing hysterically because they've all That's seen awesome. it. And yes, it is funny. You'll, you'll have to send me a picture of that. I don't think I have that one. Uh, well, I'm a worried if I send you the picture of whose hands it might actually end up in. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you can send it to me. Just don't send it to Kristen. That's that's, that's important. <laughs> right. Well, I'll show Kristen. So, Kristen, I know you're not on there and I can't hear you, but, you know, I still do have to make it down there. You know, we've been talking about a bourbon and cigar for quite a few years. So at some point I am going to make it down to your facility. Unfortunately, schedules just did not work out. And, and again, I really appreciate you guys allowing us to to uh, attend this virtually. I hope there was some great information between Sean yesterday and myself here today with, with more, sort of a more hands-on approach. And I know you guys are gonna have a great presentation from uh, Brady Anderson, or not Brady Anderson, Brady Hazlett uh, tomorrow as well. Yeah, and we're very much looking forward to that too. Um, again, it's always a pleasure working with you, Ryan. We love your demos, uh, love your enthusiasm. We're, we're right aligned with your one can per technician per week, as you well know. And uh, we just, we can't thank you enough for your time and energy and uh, to try to keep pushing this important topic forward. Absolutely. I, again, thank you guys for coming on and allowing us to, to be here. And, and huge thanks to my crew. You guys don't get to see them because they're behind the scenes, but uh, um, really just a, a great event. And I hope you guys all get uh, a lot of knowledge and wealth of experience from us out to, to apply to the, your everyday repairs. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ryan. Thank you, 3M. Um, again, we'll be back with uh, Brady tomorrow morning. Uh, we've got one more show left this evening, um, just about an hour from now, 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we're going to have Select here, and we're going to be talking about doing some structural pulls on our uh, on our rec Nissan Sentra and talk about some of the things that have changed over the past several years with advanced high-string steel, some of the adhesives that we found, uh, just the, the whole polling strategies and things that have changed around that. So. We'll be back here with uh, with Larry and the select uh, crew and Mark um, in about an hour. So we will see you then. Uh, look forward to it. Thanks.